Hello, dear White Rock concert members. I welcome you to listen to a recent discussion Marcel Bergman and George Zuckerman had regarding the Young Beethoven program that was to be performed as the second concert of the season for White Rock concerts. As you are about to hear, Marcel and George had an interesting and stimulating conversation about Beethoven and his younger works featuring the wind quintet, the sextet, and the famous septet. So sit back, relax, and enjoy my artistic director, partner, and husband, and artistic director emeritus as they muse on Beethoven's genius and early output. I'm very excited to talk with you this afternoon about a show that you put together, curated, and it's called The Young Beethoven. So uh, let's talk a little bit about that overall concept. Of well, the show. we were supposed to be performing this in just around this time, but of course the pandemic has interfered with so much of our uh, projected plans. The Young Beethoven was the, the idea was to celebrate Beethoven's 250th anniversary with music that was seldom heard. Not the great works, except one of the works on the program is really among the great works. But we were going to start with a duet, and then a trio, and then a quartet, and a quintet, a sextet, and ending with the great Beethoven septet, which was a remarkable work that he wrote sort of as a, a prelude to writing his first symphony, which came immediately afterwards in his chronology. And we were going to put these works together using a local ensemble of extraordinary players, because Vancouver has become such a, a bed, a hotbed of, of incredible talent. And we have artists here who uh, have been and belong on the international stage as well as the White Rock Baptist Church stage. And we were able to put together an ensemble with some remarkable players and some unusual works that would normally not be heard because uh, people think of Beethoven in the, well, you, you were talking about it earlier, the three periods of Beethoven's composition, the early period, the middle period, and the late period. And there are always great works that we know from each of those periods, but there are other works outside of those periods that lead into the other areas. And we thought this was an opportunity to play some music that isn't often heard by some remarkable players from our own network of artists who live and work in, in the Vancouver area. And we'd been looking forward to it so immensely, and now we're frustrated. But we will, with luck, be able to do it next year. Fantastic. So uh, one of the, the things is that uh, these works were roughly written between, I think, 1795 and 1800. And it was actually a time of remarkable productivity for Beethoven. He wrote a lot of great works. It was mainly the what you call the first period, and it stretched from Opus 15 to Opus 21. And in that short span of Opus numbers, there are Opus 15 is the first piano concerto, Opus 16 is a celebrated quintet for piano and winds. Opus 17 is the only sonata that Beethoven wrote for a wind instrument, a horn sonata written for the virtuoso Giovanni Punto. And uh, Opus 18 is a set of the great string quartets, the early period high point, perhaps. Opus 19 is the second piano concerto, Opus 20 is the septet that we were going to play on the Beethoven, Young Beethoven program. And Opus 21, right next door to the septet, Opus 21 is the first symphony. What an extraordinary, prolific writing that he was. It was all within eight or ten years while he moved from Bonn to Vienna. And he firmly established himself on the international scene, so to speak. Uh, he had uh, some fierce competition. Of course, Mozart had already been dead for a while, but Haydn was still very Haydn much alive. Was, and he went and studied with Haydn. They, right. didn't, they didn't get along very well, actually. There, there were lots of problems between those two, and it's actually funny to uh, think about the fact that he also studied with Salieri and Albrechtsberger, a little bit behind Haydn's back, and there, were, there was a funny feeling of, of competition, even though Haydn was so much older 
And he was very proud of Beethoven as a student, but Beethoven really, I think, had this urge to say, I have to establish myself, I have to become independent, and I have to show that I can be the next yeah. great classical composer, which he, right. he was. But you know, even before that incredible prolific period between the Opus 15 and Opus 21, there were a vast number of works that we very seldom hear, and that's where we excavated to find the work, some of the works for the young Beethoven. And they're interesting. They don't have opus numbers at all. They're called W-O-O, which means Werke ohne Opusal, works without opus number. And they weren't published. And Beethoven, partly he discarded them. Some of them weren't even finished, but partly he didn't think they were good enough to be published. But of course, anything that Beethoven touched was basically good. And that there are some quite remarkable works. And we talk about about uh, 230 works in that yeah. category, which is a yeah. remarkable amount. Yeah. Uh, you know, one of them is a, well, became a world famous uh, little piano piece. Oh, among the, yes, the right. Fur Elise, that piece that probably everybody in the world knows and even plays, was Overka Ona Opus. It never was published. So uh, it's not necessarily that they're going to be uh, poor works, they're just neglected. And we found, Beethoven, you know, Beethoven, when he was in Bonn, when he was a young man, he played viola in the court orchestra. And sitting there, and the viola is in a position in the orchestra between the conductor and the wind players. And on all sides of him, he would hear these virtuoso wind players, whether they were oboe or bassoon or flute, and he became very interested in his early years in the wind instruments. And so among the early works that we were going to put into the young Beethoven, there was a duet for clarinet and bassoon. He wrote three duets, and uh, we were going to play one of those or a movement of one of them. And uh, there was also, in the orchestra in Bonn, there was a remarkable horn player by the name of Nicholas Simrock. And Simrock is important, not as a horn player, but he became one of Beethoven's publishers. He started a big publishing firm in Hamburg. And, and Brahms is publisher Brahms as well. Brahms publishes as well. There's this remarkable network of people, but the world was smaller then. If you were in the music business, you more or less knew everyone. And Beethoven began to experience what these wind instruments could do and became very interested. And one of the early works that we found and that we put into the young Beethoven is, a, I would say, never before performed in Vancouver area. I may be right, I, possibly somebody will contradict me, but it's a quintet, and a quintet for a group of instruments such as you've never thought of. For a clarinet, a bassoon, and hold your hat, three French horns. He not only knew Nicolas Simrock, he also heard one of the great horn virtuoso of that period who traveled the world uh, because he had discovered a way to make the horn capable of playing many, many notes more than one expected. The horn was usually associated with hunting calls and minimum uh, beautiful harmonies, but minimum melodic potential. And this uh, horn player, Giovanni Punto, was able to play extraordinary virtuoso works. So Beethoven heard this horn player and he became fascinated with the horn. And you know, the interesting thing is that that fascination crept into his later periods, into the middle period and the late period. In the Emperor Concerto, which is right in the heart, the Piano Concerto, number five, right in the heart of the middle period, the horns have an extraordinary moment of beauty that just shows what the, that instrument could do. And I always think how Beethoven must have been impressed as a young man listening to this virtuoso playing by these wind players. Right, and, and for instance, the three horns in the scherzo of the Eroica. And then in the Eroica Symphony, three horns. Uh, yeah, that's the wonderful And that's what he idea. used in, the, uh, in this quintet. And it's really, the quintet almost foretells what he wants to do in the scherzo of the Eroica right. Symphony, because he had his love 
for wind instruments. And the septet, which, by the way, was the last work that he ever used wind instruments as soloists. He treated the clarinet, the horn, and the bassoon as soloists, accompanied by a string ensemble, and he made this wonderful septet, a great work which uh, foretells everything that's going to come in the symphonies later on. The work was immensely popular when it was written. Right, and it's, it's interesting because there was a concert around 1800 that featured Beethoven's first symphony and the septet. And the septet. And he, and wanted, the... Yeah, he wanted really the septet to be heard in the same concert as that first symphony. And he and... wrote to his brother shortly after that saying, I wish they'd burn that damn septet. Why? Because nobody is listening to anything else I've written since. It was so popular. Right, and ironically these two works were actually during Beethoven's lifetime were the most popular two works. And of course now it has shifted in the meantime. Uh, especially the septet has unfortunately suffered uh, from some negligence, even though it's a terrific work, it's a beautiful work. It's still sort of in a, very much in the classical style of a serenade. And we can talk a little bit about uh, the wealth of ideas that uh, well, Beethoven showed. We would really have loved to have showed. played that because that was our, the culmination of our young Beethoven program. Right. But we weren't quite satisfied with the, we had the W.O.O. works, works without opus, the duet, and the quintet with three horns. There was also a sextet that Beethoven wrote for two horns, probably for Punto and Simrock, right. because he knew them both. And he wrote that, and strangely enough, it comes out as Opus 87. Marcel, how do you explain 81. that? 81. Now, why would it be Opus 81? Because it was written well before any of the Opus 15 or 16. It simply wasn't published. Right, and that, that's one of the anomalies about the opus. Otherwise, it's fairly straightforward and pretty correct, usually, the allocation of the opus numbers. But in this case, not because opus 81A is the Les Adieux piano sonata, which is a late yeah, sonata uh, by Beethoven. And so it's really uh, an unusual coupling. And of course, the opus 81 like that. piano sonata probably was written. Of course, it was later written on at that time. In that, when that it was, time, when it was when published. 81. And, it's a, it's a strange anomaly of these early works, and they're often early works for wind instruments, because the other one is a great octet, with two oboes, two clarinets, two horns, and two bassoons, written in 1790, before the quintet, before any of those opus number 15 to 21, and it turns up as opus 103. Uh, so you'd think that was a great work of late Beethoven. Of course, it's very early Beethoven. What, for you personally, makes the septet such an outstanding piece in terms of its structure, in terms of how he uses not only the wind instruments, but also the string instruments? Well, he treats each instrument like a soloist. There's one movement, a ser uh, which is a theme and variations, a very standard form that every composer used. He took a simple little drinking melody and, and turned it into a, a set of variations. The first variation is just for the violin and the viola together. And it has a wonderful quality of transparency and openness. And then he adds the instrument, he adds the cello. And then he adds the clarinet and the bassoon for a little thickness of quality and of sound. And then he gives a variation to just the clarinet and the bassoon alone. So he plays around with all of the possible permutations. Right. Because, you know, composing a piece of music, even in the 19th, 18th century, was a matter of calculating exactly what you're going to do. It didn't just happen out of thin air. I mean, Beethoven was a genius, yes, but he had a genius that had to be expressed and formalized in, in written notes and of course in a concept that made sense and was not going to just go sprawling all over the page. And it still has a certain, it's, it's a very uh, kind of uh, sprightly work, it's spirited, it is entertaining. It really uh, has a wonderful balance between being deep enough but also light enough 
And even though it's a substantial work, right? It's probably the longest work of the whole program. It's over 40 minutes. It's 40 minutes. Uh, you never feel the the time, and you you never think, oh, this is sort of a big piece or something. No, I would say so we, love, we love the septet for the way he treated the, uh, the various instruments, the right. strings, always. The double bass is uh, an interesting use there. Uh, it's of course the foundation; it gives right. you the, the bottom sound. But in the in the end of the variation, he has a little moment where he allows the double bass to growl away for about uh, five seconds, all on its own until the others come in to. And he the, gives a beautiful solo again to the horn, you know, again and one of those. Uh, movements and, and he treats uh, one of the movements, the scherzo, uh, which is the movement before the last, is almost a miniature. French horn concerto. So he had always in the back of his mind the virtuosity of what the wind instruments could do. But once he had written his first symphony, he was in a way released from any obligation to write more for the winds as soloists. And he treated them as they became characteristically known during the whole of the 19th century as important factors in the orchestral fabric. Right but not necessarily as such established and necessary soloists as the violin and, of course, the piano and even the cello, which began to emerge as a soloist towards the end of the 19th. In conclusion to our conversation, uh, I would like to quote uh, actually something that you came up with uh, as a wonderful little uh, closing comment, and it is Beethoven already waited 250 years, another year won't bother him too much. Well, thank you for stealing my good line, but that's absolutely true. And we were looking forward with such pleasure to, the, uh, to being able to put this show on, simply because it gives us a chance to talk about Beethoven, to introduce some works that have probably never before been heard, but also to show the genesis of so much of the later Beethoven that everyone is vastly more familiar with. So it will be both educational and entertaining. So hopefully the pandemic will be allowing us to be back on stage by next year. I'm looking forward to seeing our White Rock audience again, and here's hoping that there is the possibility of proceeding and bringing you the young Beethoven. Absolutely. We are really looking forward to this. Let's keep our fingers crossed that it can happen next season. And thank you again for your thoughts on all of this. It was very informative and entertaining. Thank you, thank Marcel. You.